Hello and welcome to the New World Rum Club. This is Rum Stories and the first story I'd like to take you through is called Piranhas in Guyana. Now this is a story about El Dorado five-year-old and why it is one of my favourite most memorable rums. Now considering I've recently done a video looking at the 10 rare collections which are the premium sippers aged between 12 and 21 years, why would a five-year-old El Dorado rum costing in the region of 20 to 30 pounds be more memorable than those sippers. I'd like to take you on that journey and tell you a little bit more about it. So the first thing is Guyana. Where is it? So it's stuck at the top of South America in between Suriname, Venezuela and Brazil. Um, and it's, it's a country that is not too large and has a very small population. And the reason it has a small population is because it's covered in rainforests. It's called the, the Guyanese Shield and it is the reason we went there. There are only four pristine rainforests in the world and this is one of them and it was the convincing factor for my wife and I to go on this adventure. Now why might you have heard of Guyana? Well basically in the rum world they are famous for Demerara Distillers Limited and the heritage stills that they have there. They've got the wooden heritage stills of the Port Morant, the Enmore and the Versailles but they also have the metal coffee stills which are the French Savelle and the Diamond. Um, in this instance, we're just talking about the El Dorado five-year-old, but I'd also like to highlight where our journey began. And our journey began in a place called Cayman House in the Rupanui, right down here in the middle of Guyana. Now this is really not an easy place to get to. You can either go by boat, by bus, by um, minibus. Uh, or in the case that we had, we ended up flying part of the way and getting a boat. So it started in Georgetown. We boarded a small plane. We flew over the Guyanese shield, which fundamentally looked like a broccoli from the top, as you can see here. And as we started to land, we saw the, uh, the setting for our piranhas in Guyana. This is the Rupanui River, and this is where our story begins. So at Cayman House, there is not much there. Literally, this is a wildlife haven, and they have a research centre next to the river with a few houses where people congregate from around the world. There is a real hub of activity at this place. To give you an example, you've got PhD students from top universities in America. You've got researchers from Europe, from Asia. You've got the occasional tourist, which was myself and Vicky. And the reason we wanted to go there was to really experience what it's like to be in a research centre rather than to be in a hotel. And to do that, we had to contribute. Most people are here because of the black caiman. The biodiversity, the other animals are all key, but the black caiman are some of the best in the world and the biggest in the world. They go up to 12 foot and these guys are out most nights on the boat, catching, tagging, measuring, researching and putting all of that data back into science to better understand more about this region of Guyana. And that's exactly why we were there. The first evening we were there, we were having an open dinner with all of these great people and the stories were flowing. You heard stories from all over the world, but the story started to go into Guyana, the Rupanui River and what's inside it. Now, obviously you've got the Black Cayman and there's some great stories there, but you've also got otters, you've got snakes and you've got piranhas. And when the conversation about piranhas came up, my wife and I were quite excited. We've seen them on National Geographic, we've seen them on David Attenborough, and we really wanted to see them in the real world. So as the conversation was flowing, the drinks were going down, one of the local Amerindians offered to take us on a fishing trip the next day. Now we said, absolutely, 100%, that'd be great. So off to bed, and in the morning, we woke up and, uh, and had a chat with them about, right, let's get, prep, let's get going. Um, so what do you need for a piranha fishing trip? Not a huge amount, a wooden boat. For us, we needed a guide, a river, a sandbank, and in this case, a part of a jungle. Now, just before we got in the boat to launch, he had to quickly jump out and said, look, I've forgotten the secret ingredient for piranha fishing, ran back to his house, came back with a bag, jumped in the boat, and off we went. At this point, we start going up river. He knows the local spot and it takes a while to get there. And as we do that, he starts to explain the three rules of piranha fishing. Number one, don't lose a finger. Now we thought this was quite comical. It turns out it's very, very serious. And I'll explain later why. Number two was don't fall out of the boat. 
seems an obvious one, but again, take it seriously. And the third one was your catch is your dinner. What, what I actually transcribed into was we were going out with him and we were catching dinner, not just for ourselves, but for his family and his kids. And that was really special because it meant that we can't just go out there on a fishing trip. We had to catch something. And as a reward, he said his secret ingredient is that he's going to reward us with a shot of rum for every piranha we catch. Now, we were there going, that sounds like an amazing fishing trip. We can't fail. So let's see what we have to offer. As we go up, we start to understand more about rule two. Don't fall out the boat. Now, you may think this is just a nice picture of a black caiman, but really, as we were going up, we saw 20 of these. You know, we saw them on the banks. We saw them swimming up to the boats. You don't want to fall out. If there's caimans there, you've also got the piranhas there. Um, as we went further up, you start to see the beauty that is this, this country. You know, we're going up through giant water lilies that you could walk on. You see the wildlife, the herons. We're navigating through all of this. And where we're trying to get to is, is a corner of the river, which is where the piranhas normally congregate to eat. So we finally get somewhere, we moor the boat up, and he starts to explain how to do piranha fishing. Now the toolkit was a bit of meat, a hook and a nylon rope, and that was it. So when he started talking about don't lose a finger, the rationale started to come out. He said, if you decide to uh, wrap it round your finger as you go fishing, a piranha catches it, it will take your finger off. So make sure you're not wrapping it around your finger. We suddenly realised why it's a serious rule. He also said, once you catch a fish, you want to see its teeth, etc. Do not stick your finger in its mouth. It will bite it off. Now, again, when we did finally catch a fish, we understood that rule very, very clearly. They are not small. We both got a fishing line each and off we went. Now, we're both quite competitive people. The fact that Vicky caught the first fish was fine. Didn't bother me one bit. I was really happy for her. And we started to get the realisation that we are in piranha territory. One nil to Vicky. Shot of El Dorado. She's feeling quite smug. Let's carry on. Two nil to Vicky. So a second piranha caught very quickly afterwards. Um, our guide is giving her a second shot going very well done and I'm starting to think about what am I doing wrong anyway still early days 3-0 a third one comes on and I think she's taken the mick so I start to have a chat to the guide and go what am I doing wrong this doesn't look complicated but somehow I've got zero on the table and my wife is getting quite merry on El Dorado five-year-old rum as you can see I'm sat there with some bait still not succeeding a fourth one right i've had it at this point i'm saying to the guide right my wife's getting nicely uh nicely drunk on some rum she's giggling and smiling like a cheshire cat and i'm sat there going still not caught a single fish so i get the guide involved and i said look you know can you help me so he throws the line in straight away he catches one first off he looks at me smiles pours himself an El Dorado, has a sip, puts it down and asks me to carry on. I did eventually catch one. It took around 45 minutes. They were both laughing at me throughout that period. Um, but I did get one and I did get my rum ration, which I was more than happy about. So what I want to talk to you about again is why El Dorado five-year-old is one of my favourite rums. And the reason is it doesn't matter if it's a premium sipper or just something that is um, a cheap white rum that you use for mixing. It's what you do with it, the people you share your rum with, the memories that you create through this. Now, we didn't even expect any rum on the boat. We didn't realise that rum was a secret ingredient for piranha fishing. But in this case, it was. And every time my wife and I have a El Dorado of any range, but especially the five-year-old, it takes us back to being on a wooden boat with an Amerindian local, doing piranha fishing, having a laugh at everything around us. And it was such a good memory that to this day, you know, that is where we stand. One final thing. My wife and I will never, ever settle on this, but um, it was all about who caught the biggest piranha. Now, in my eyes, I definitely caught the biggest piranha, although I may only have caught one fish, it was definitely the biggest. 
She disagrees. We're eight years on. We've still not solved this argument and I don't think we will. It might come to a climax where we just find ourselves going back to Guyana and doing something similar, which I think would make us both happy. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that rum, uh, that rum story. And, uh, and if you like what I'm doing, please do subscribe because there's plenty more stories, collections and vlogs to come. And I'm more than happy to listen to any of your feedback or your stories so that I can learn from you guys as well. Thank you. Goodbye.